Okay. Hey, welcome everyone, and welcome back to another session of Pre-Dental Universe. I'm Tiffany, one of the Pre-Dental students monitoring today's session, along with Sherry. Um, we have an exciting presentation today with Dr. Hobbs. And before we begin, I just want to thank Dr. Hobbs for taking the time to share your experience and some of your professional insight with us. And on that note, um, feel free to take it whenever you're ready, Dr. Hobbs. It cut off, so I didn't hear you, but um, Tiffany cut off. I didn't hear what she said. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, feel free to take it away whenever you're ready, Dr. Okay. Hobbs. So, um, um, hi everybody, my name is Hannah Hobbs. I am a periodontist uh, and I practice in Hillsborough, North Carolina, which is right outside of uh, Durham where Duke University is. And if anybody has any questions, please, um, I guess Sherry wants them at the end. Um, so, um, my presentation today is on um, lasers in periodontal therapy, but first I was gonna go over, there's a new periodontal classification system that has been adopted by the American Academy of Periodontology in 2017 and has been adopted by the American Dental Association in 2021. Uh, it's, this is a very big change for us. The last uh, change was in 1999. So in our world, in the periodontal world, this is a big deal. Uh, we classify periodontal disease. The classic periodontal disease is uh, early, moderate, and severe. So the new classification system has it now in stages and in grades, and I'll kind of just go over that real briefly because I know most of you probably aren't quite there yet, but there's different types of periodontal disease. There's necrotizing, which is ANUG and ANUP. Um, there's periodontal disease as a manifestation of systemic diseases. The most obvious one is diabetes. As a matter of fact, periodontal disease is considered the sixth comp. Um, so let me go forward. Um, how we measure attachment loss in periodontics, we take a probe and we measure down to the depth of the pocket and then we add how much recession the patient has. So in this example, the patient has a six millimeter pocket because the probe is broken down by three millimeter increments and the CEJ, which is a cemento enamel junction where the dentin enamel meet is right there at the gingival margin. So they have no uh, change in the gingival margin. So the true attachment loss is six. In this example, there's a pseudo pocket, the tissue's swollen. So the pocket is a nine millimeter pocket, but the CEJ, the gingival margin is about three millimeters. So that's a negative number. So the clinical attachment loss is six. In the next example, it's still six millimeters of attachment loss, but the patient has recession. So you add that to the pocket depth. The pocket depth is a four and the CJ to gingival margin is two millimeters. So the uh, clinical attachment loss is six. So uh, let me just show you, this is what necrotizing periodontitis is. It's called ANUG or ANUP. You've got these punched out papillas. Um, this was really common in people that uh, in the 17, 1800s who were on boats and they would get what's called scurvy because they lacked vitamin C. You don't see this very much now. It's usually someone who's uh, severely immune and compromised will have this presentation. Um, this is an example of someone that has a very rare disease called papillon Lefebvre syndrome, and they get advanced periodontal disease. This person is in, only in their teens, but as you can see, they have a lot of bone loss and they've lost a lot of teeth. All right, so um, this new classification system, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, um, the differentiation, instead of early, moderate, and severe, it's stage one, two, three, and four. Stage four, this is how I remember, I worked my way backwards. Stage four, the patient is gonna lose all their teeth. Stage three, they, they're gonna lose one or more teeth. Stage two is they have moderate periodontitis. That would be the same as early or moderate to severe periodontitis. And initial periodontitis is, is early. They have probing depths in a few areas. So um, let me just get through this and I'll show you some cases. This is stage one. This patient has clinical attachment loss of one to two millimeters. The RBL, which means radiographic bone loss is less than 15%. In a, um, so there's only less than a 15% of bone loss and it's usually in the coronal third of the tooth. And the maximum probing depth is less than four millimeters. 
And that's what the x-rays look like. You see they have some radiographic bone loss, but not as severe as any other in the next few stages. Um, stage two, you're starting to see recession, which is clinical attachment loss. Your pocket depths are higher, and you, you've got a probing depth no higher than five millimeters. So, um, and this is the radiographic appearance of stage two. Then stage um, three is, they remember stage three, they're gonna lose some teeth. They have deeper pockets. They start to get furcation involvement. If anybody knows what that is, that's when you get between the roots of the teeth, uh, either an upper molar or a lower molar. And this is what it looks like on the radiograph. And then this is stage four. This person was going to need a complex rehabilitation. They are going to lose all their teeth. They have severe ridge defect, bite collapse, drifting, flaring, and um, they have lost more than five teeth due to periodontal disease. And this patient, as you can see, this is all crown and bridge, and you're going to wind up losing a lot of their, pretty much their entire dentition. You can replace it with dentures or a denture supported with implants or implants supported with uh, fixed uh, crown and bridge. And this is what the radiographs look like for someone who's stage four. So um, this also, this re, uh, change in classification also started with um, soft tissue grafting. So you have different types of recession. You have RT1, 2, and 3. So I think the easiest thing would be to show you have um, recession here where the gum is receded away from the teeth. And that's what we as periodontists do. We correct these kinds of defects. And in this case, I did a soft tissue graft where I took tissue from the patient's palate and rotated it there and covered the roots. Everyone always asks me what this is. This is a defect that the patient had in their enamel. It's um, some kind of enamel defect, but um, it, it's just, it's, it's asymptomatic, so you don't treat it. And if it's an aesthetic issue, you can treat it with a, a composite or, or a veneer. Here's some of that has R2 recession. You see the recession is, they've got blended papillas. There's a freedom pole. And same thing here, you see more of the root is exposed. Recession type three, this is actually one of my patients that I treated recently. She has, you can see this is her molar, the, almost the entire root is exposed. And this person was an ortho, was in braces, and you see how much recession they have. And then I show um, how I did the surgery for that patient. I did a connective tissue graft where I took tissue from the underlying surface here and then rotated it and covered the root. Um, here's some more before and after. This is someone that had recession, and I did a connective tissue graft, and this is how it turned out. Um, this is someone who was in braces, ortho, and you see this is called a freedom pole, and the roots are, you know, almost the entire length of the root is exposed. So I know in this case, I'm not going to be able to cover all her roots, and this is the result that we got afterwards. She's wearing her Invisalign tray right here uh, on the top. She's done with the ortho. So I did her graft, uh, a connective tissue graft, almost at the end of her ortho, like she was just about to have them removed about two weeks after I finished my graft. If the if the brackets weren't there, her teeth would probably be very mobile because of all the recession and the attachment loss. All right, so why we're here today is to talk about uh, laser-assisted surgery. So I have been laser uh, certified to treat periodontal disease for almost 11 years. Um, I had a type of laser, which there's many types of lasers. There's CO2, uh, NDAG, Erbium, I had an NDAG laser, and just in on the past October, I bought a new laser that has two wavelengths, the NDAG and the Erbium. So depending on what you want to treat, you need a different type of um, laser wavelength. So the NDAG is specifically meant for soft tissue, whereas the Erbium is meant for hard tissue. You can cut a tooth with it, you can remove a crown, you can treat a failing implant. And I'll show a bunch of cases uh, shortly. So this is what the term laser means. It came from a, an acronym that was developed in 
safety, it's light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. And that's where the word laser comes from. And it was first applied in dentistry by Miamen in 1960. So as I said, there's three, there's many different types of layer, erbium, NDIAG, and the one, the newest layer that I have combines these two together. And there's a diode and then there's a CO2 laser. They all have different wavelengths and they have different crystals that create the energy that puts out the light. And basically you capture that light by a reflection of several mirrors. And then that light is streamed through a stylus, almost like you would have for a, a notebook or a notepad. And it comes out and you use that fiber in a stylus to, to do what you need to do in whether it's periodontal surgery, like I'll show or doing uh, um, crown and bridge or taking crowns off or treating uh, failing in one. So um, for the sake of time, I'll just explain to you that um, again, the lasers all fall on a different spectrum of electromagnetic. So here we have the NDIAG is at 1064. The erbium is at 270 uh, or 290. The CO2 is at 10,000. So the greater the number is, the greater the penetration and the greater the burning of the tissue is. So a CO2 laser, you see it is at 10,000, whereas the NDIAG is one-tenth that strength. So the energy is not absorbed as profoundly and broadly in the tissue. Um, how does the laser affect the tissue? So there's several ways. Uh, ideally, you want it to be absorbed and not scattered. You don't want it to be transmitted too deeply. So you get the a significant transmission with a CO2 laser, whereas with the NDIAG, it's only absorbed by dark things. So gram-negative bacteria pick up the NDIAG wavelength. Um, hemoglobin laden cells. So in cells that are inflamed that line the pocket of the tooth will pick up this energy. It will not be picked up by bone or, or uh, bone, which is hydroxyapatite or tooth. Whereas the erbium, it's picked up by the water, which is in hydroxyapatite. So it's picked up by bone and tooth. Okay, so this again kind of goes over lasers like diodes and NDIs are predominantly absorbed. If you can remember this, is just by dark things like hemoglobin or melanin pigmentation. So gram negative obligate anaerobes that live deep, deep in the pocket will absorb this energy and the healthy cells will not. So even if there's um, bacteria that have penetrated the epithelial lining of the pocket, the energy of the laser is only absorbed by the bacteria and they basically kind of explode uh, and they're released from the tissue. So spirochetes are known to absorb, to penetrate into connective tissue and epithelium and the NDIAG kind of photo sterilizes the pocket for that reason. Erbium and CO2 lasers are absorbed by water and hydroxyapatite and you can cut a tooth with the erbium laser and a CO2 laser and you can cut bone. CO2 lasers are really, really great for hemostasis, but the energy of the laser, remember that slide that I showed, it penetrates really deeply and, and laterally. So you will get a lot of tissue charring with a CO2 laser. Um, so lasers have been used in dentistry for since the 1960s. Um, the FDA has actually approved um, the use of NDIAG laser for regeneration for a bone cementum and ligament uh, in the early 2000s. And I bought my laser, my very first laser in like, you know, I think like 11 years ago. So for me, I'll speak a lot about periodontal procedures because I am a periodontist. So I use it mainly for pocket reduction. I use it for a phrenectomy and I'll show what that is. I use it to treat uh, failing implants and that's what this word is, peri-implantitis. It can all, uh, the erbium lasers can also be used to remove decay or make a cavity preparation, recontour bone. You can use it in endodontic treatment to put the laser light through the root canal and it can like basically push out all the debris through the lateral canals that would never have been instrumented. So that, those are hard tissue lasers. All right. Um, 
So let me just uh, start showing you a couple of cases. Um, these are all my cases that I've done. This is uh, laser cystic pedal surgery with the NDAG laser. Uh, and these are the steps of the laser treatment. Uh, the very first thing we do is we get the patient numb and then we do what that first set of slides showed where we go back and measure the attachment loss that they have. It's called sounding. We're really measuring down to bone because sometimes a patient has so much calculus, you really can't measure without them jumping out of the chair or being so painful and you're not getting a two pocket. The next step is to take the laser fiber and the laser is the thickness of a human hair. And we basically go in the pocket and it removes all this diseased tissue. It just selectively ablates that diseased tissue then the next step, uh, I clean with either a piezo uh, instrument or a cavitron. The last step, form a seal, again, back with the laser with uh, on a fibrin clot from which the gum goes back and re-adheres to the teeth. And we check the bite to make sure that the tooth is not in traumatic occlusion because if the tooth is hitting really high, it kind of vibrates in the socket and it won't heal. This is the comparison of what I used to do. Um, we would have a deep pocket, we would get the patient numb, lift the gum away, uh, you clean the debris or you add bone or you recontour bone and you close it. So this is way more painful because you're cutting into the soft tissue and that's where you get all your pain when you cut into tissue. Um, you get swelling, you have sutures, and a lot of times after conventional periodontal surgery, you get a lot of recession where the teeth become more receded, uh, the gums more receded, and you see more of the root structure and the teeth are super sensitive. The advantages of the laser surgery versus scalpel, there's minimal post-op pain, there's no swelling, there's virtually no need to, uh, for any pain medication. Um, so most of my patients, they take one or two ibuprofen and they say on a scale of one to 10, it's a one event. The no need to stop medication, a lot of the patients are on blood thinners, for example, like Coumadin, Xarelto, um, Eliquis. With a laser, you do not because part of the laser treatment is a hemostatic effect and it gets clotting to happen. There's no scarring, there's no recession. There's very low risk of infection because you remember again, like I said, we're photo sterilizing to the depth of the pocket and there's so faster soft tissue healing. This is my laser that I have now. And like you see here, it has um, two wands. This is the erbium arm right here, which is the heart tissue laser, or I use it to treat failing implants or periimplantitis. And this is the ND YAG portion. And there's different ports for it here. The screen, I can touch the screen and uh, pull up what I want to do. And it, uh, it has like a menu that I can select through. Uh, this is me in my office. Uh, this is actually my husband. I'm just using it for my um, website. I was taking this. And this is me just showing how I use the laser. It's um, actually quite rather large. It's, but it's on rollers and we roll it in and out. Um, and I have another handpiece that goes here that's used for biostem, and I can talk about that in a minute. So the reason people are gravitating towards um, laser therapy is that it's very, very minimally invasive. Whether it's restorative or um, periodontal surgery, it's minimally invasive. It's used in endodontics. It's used, for example, in veneer a preparation, preparing for a veneer. I use it when I take out teeth to go in and decontaminate the extraction site because it, remember, it photo sterilizes the pocket. It gets rid of whatever bacteria that's embedded in the bone or the soft tissue. And no matter how much magnification, and I wear loops, not this obviously, but I wear magnification of 3.5, but sometimes you just can't see the debris that's there. So the laser will photo sterilize the site. I use it to treat failing implants and I use the Erbium portion of that. It can be used for teeth whitening. Night Lays is um, something that's really specific to the laser I just got. So there's a big part of dentistry now that's talking about how a lot of the reasons we see failures in dentistry, whether it's cracked teeth, failed root canals, failed implant, is because a patient has obstructive airway problems. 
And with the night lays or the slazer, I can go in and basically remodel the soft palate so that it raises up and the posterior pharynx opens up and their airway stays more patent or open. Um, and um, it's just, a, that's a whole nother lecture on its own. So um, the advantages of the laser is that it sterilizes the mouth, it reduces the bacteria load and promotes gingival healing. Anyone, anyone is a good candidate for laser therapy. There's no contraindication. Whereas with conventional perio surgery, you had to have the patient either reduce their Coumadin, get their Coumadin level to a certain le uh, point where their INR is between 2.1 and 2.5. They have to stop their Eliquis. And sometimes it's not an option that we can stop these patients' medication, especially, for example, someone's had a stent within the last year. The cardiologist is not going to take them off of um, Eliquis or uh, their blood thinner because they're afraid of getting a clot in their stent. So to do conventional surgery, they would have, we'd have profound bleeding and it would be just a very difficult surgery for everyone involved. So the advantage of the rate of the lasers that it reduces uh, bleeding because the high energy light beam promotes clotting. That's the very last step. It's a hemostatic step. And this is really advantageous. If someone has a lot of inflammations like diabetics that are not well controlled, patients on blood thinners or even hemophiliacs. There's less likelihood of infection, um, less tissue damage, rapid healing, very little recession. So um, let me just go on and just show some of my cases. This is the very, very first case I've treated with uh, laser therapy. And this was a young lady, she was in her 30s and she was missing this tooth. And she has like what we call a flipper, which is a removable appliance. And she was gonna have a bridge done from here to here to, um, you know, replace that missing tooth because this was a removable appliance. So you see the inflammation that she has here and here. As a periodontist, I know if I go in with a scalpel and cut into this, it, the papilla would end up up here at the end. So this was my very first case that I did with the laser. And this is what it looks like right after the laser is treated. You see the fibrin clot around the teeth that were treated. And remember, I went through those steps. And then here she is um, four weeks later. The papilla is pink and firm, and there's no loss of the papilla. I didn't lose this papilla, which can create an aesthetic problem. You'll have a black triangle. So it's really important to preserve the papilla in the anterior segment. Here's another case. This is a pyogenic granuloma. This is a inflammatory response that has never gone back to healthy tissue. You'll see this a lot in pregnant women. So I know as a periodontist, if I go in and cut this out with a scalpel, I will have a huge black triangle here. So instead I treated it with the laser and over a month it receded away um, and that's her final result. Here is another example. Uh, this patient had a pyogenic granuloma right here between, um, this is tooth 18 and 19. And this is about two weeks after the laser treatment. You can already see the tissue tone improvement is turning pink and firm. Um, this is a patient I saw about a few months ago and she had this large swelling on the lingual of the maxillary incisors. So again, if I go in and cut this out, which I can, it will leave a very large soft tissue deficit and her teeth will be super sensitive. So instead I decided to do a laser treatment and here she is the day of the laser surgery. This is right after she was done. You know, you see this pyogenic granuloma has been removed during the treatment. And then here she is, she's healed four weeks later. This is before and this is after. The staining that you see here is from um, this thing that we give patients called paradise or chlorhexidine. And it, um, it has a side effect of it is antibacterial, it's actually bacteriostatic, not bactericidal. It stops bacteria from uh, replicating, but it, it can stain the teeth after use for a while. So in the US, we use a 0.12% solution, whereas in Europe, they use a, like a 0.2 solution. Um, 
And I guess in Europe, they're okay with the patients having more stain on their teeth, whereas in America, that would never be accepted, right? Um, so this is a, a bit, one of the very first full mouth laser cases that I did. The patient had uh, scaling or replating or what we call deep cleaning. Um, not with me, but with somebody else 15 years ago. And it was a very painful experience for him. So he decided not to go back. He stopped going to the dentist and that usually happens. Somebody has a negative experience. They decide not to return to the dentist. So he comes in to see me and, um, he's got a lot of issues going on. Obviously he's got a crossbite, but all this yellow stuff is tartar. He's got severe inflammation. The tissue is cyanotic, which means it lacks oxygen. It's edematous, which is swollen. It bleeds on probing. Um, and so he drove from three hours away to see me. So I decided to do his whole mouth in one sitting because he drove three hours away. Um, so here's his x-ray. I wind up taking this tooth out during the treatment. But as you can see, he's got a lot of bone loss. One could make a very good argument to take all his teeth out and do implants, but he psychologically was not ready to do that. He wanted to try to save his teeth. So um, here he is the day of the surgery. You see the fibrin clot again that I was talking about and all the calculus is removed. So I want everyone to keep their eye on this tooth. This is tooth number 27, which is the lower right canine. And remember he's in crossbite so, uh, and he wind up doing ortho to correct that, but we'll get to that. So. Here he is one month after the laser treatment, and you see how pink and firm his tissue is. But keep an eye on this tooth. You see, if you compare preoperative to post-op, you see how the tissue's actually grown up over the root, and that's what will happen. You'll get what's called gingival creep. Then I was able to see him three years later and you see that he has even more attached tissue on the root. It's just, it's regenerated. He basically regenerated his own tissue. Okay. Um, this was one of my most, like in, in everyone's career, there's one case that stands out to you. And so in my laser career, I have other parts, like I do implants and soft tissue graft. In my laser career, this is the case that really um, just took my breath away because uh, I didn't think it would work, but it worked. So she's a 30 year old patient. She was my, uh, one of my really good friends, dental receptionist, and she was in braces. So um, I get texted a lot of x-rays um, all day as a specialist, people send me x-rays. Can you give your opinion? What do you think? Could we save this tooth? So this x-ray was texted to me uh, and this is her cone beam. I don't know if everybody knows what a cone beam is, but this is a three-dimensional view of the teeth. So this x-ray was texted me and my friend Deb said, what do you think? Can we save these teeth? And I said, no, there's no way, you know, there's no bone around them. Here's the bone and you can see there's 100% bone loss around these teeth, 100%. And if you look at the cone beam, the teeth are literally floating. It's through the inferior border of the mandible. And if we look at it cross-sectional view, you can see that the only thing holding the teeth in her mouth is the orthodontic brackets. There's no bone around it at all. So at this point, from my training, I know that this is an endoperio, which means when the infection has gotten so bad that it wraps around the root, the nerve of the tooth is contaminated. And in order to have a successful treatment outcome, I would need to have the root canal done first and then the perio. So I sent her to the endodontist and they did the endo. And then I, oh, sorry. Um, then he, here she is the day of her surgery. You can see where she's had the root canal access is right here. And she had a fistula here and she had, you can kind of get a hint of the fistulas that were there. So this is her four months after the laser treatment. I didn't add a bone graft, I didn't anything. I was able to decontaminate the site enough that her own body filled in the bone that was missing. So to compare, here's where we were before, right after the root canal was done, and this is four months later. You see the difference here? This is new bone that grew. And that from here to here to here. And I was able to follow up on her. Here's the comparison at 18 months. 
here's the comparison three years later and here it is five years later so i never in my wildest dream would have thought that when you present with something like this where basically the tooth is floating and i did try to talk to the patient about taking the teeth out and i knew it would be a very challenging uh, bone grafting situation because she literally had no bone to graft to and she said, no, I'm getting married um, next October, and I want to have my teeth. And till this day, she has her teeth. I don't have any follow-up, but it's been about seven years since I've done this. I, don't, I need to get x-rays on her, but um, this was a case that really, um, really made me believe in the, if you improve the, if you remove the pathogens and the etiology and allow the body to heal itself, it can um, so I get asked a lot, what is the hygiene protocol, which is mean what, how do they get their teeth cleaned after the laser surgery? And it's basically, they can't go below the gum for at least six months after the surgery, but they can clean above it. And usually the day of the surgery, we tell the patient for the next week, they can't brush or floss. And we give them a very special soft surgery brush uh, when they come back for their follow-up in one or two weeks. And then um, they can brush with that for another week, and then they can resume their regular brushing and flossing. Because the biggest thing, you don't want to disrupt that fibrin clot. You remember that red mark around the teeth. Okay, I, I didn't know if anybody had any questions at this point. I'll just take a sip of water. Sherry, should I go on? Yes, we'll take all of the questions at the end of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so this is like a running joke. Uh, you floss the teeth that you want to keep. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so as I've gotten more experience with the laser, I've tried different indications, um, different treatments. Um, this was another one of those cases that you kind of like touches your heart. I uh, remember I said the 30 year old um, this gentleman was a 91 year old. He has multiple myeloma. And I don't know if anybody here knows what multiple myeloma is, but it's a cancer of the bone marrow. And the longer the patient has it, the worse the prognosis is. They're usually put on IV bisphosphonates. So why is that a big deal? Because these drugs cause osteonecrosis, literally necrosis of the bone spontaneously. It, the bone will start necrosis. And when he came in, he looked like that guy in the movie Up, you know, the guy with the balloons. He came with his little walker and he said, honey, all I want to do is be able to eat. And so I, I took a look at him. Um, so just to, to go back to IV bisphosphonate, there's oral bisphosphonates, which are, you know, like Boniva. Um, can't think of the other one. Um, but the IV bisphosphonates are given to treat multiple myeloma, metastatic breast cancer, cancer of the bone. And uh, they're basically trying to save the patient's life, but it has profound side effects. So um, here's what osteonecrosis looks like. It's not that patient, but this is a patient that had metastatic breast cancer. The white that you're seeing is her bone exposed. The soft tissue has retracted. These are uh, implants that were done and you see the bone is exposed here and here. This is profoundly painful and this is spontaneous. Nobody had, she didn't have a cleaning. She hadn't been to a dentist or anything. She just had metastatic breast cancer to her bones and they had her on IV bisphosphonate. And when I saw her, I basically called the oncologist and I said, she's got osteonecrosis. And at that point they stopped the bisphosphonates and they do uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment and try to get this to close over. And it's, it's usually a very, very difficult thing. The patients usually wind up dying of sepsis. They get an infection and they die. So anyway, um, this gentleman came in and this is how he presented. He had memories, 91 sweet little old guy looked like that guy up with the balloons and he has a fistula here and you just see his tissue looks horrible you can understand why this man can't eat and so i thought well he had um here's some close-ups of his front teeth he has a lot of debris because obviously it hurts for him to brush and the, the silver things that you see here he's got a partial arrest around his teeth so i thought well i'm gonna try my laser on him 
because I knew if you look here, this is where he had that fish. So you see how the bone is sort of modeled. That's what we call it. Modeled is sort of like punched out. Um, he's got osteonecrosis here. So I decided to do one arch at a time. I did the lower arch and here's the, his uh, charting. But here he is the day of the surgery. I went in and used my laser and you see the fiber and clot. Uh, and he really had very little pain, you know, like took Tylenol. Then here's a close up of the uh, area of 30 where he's missing a tooth where he has a spontaneous osteonecrosis. Here he comes back two weeks later, literally night and day. Uh, it's just a profound improvement. So then I got more brave and I said, let me go treat the upper teeth. Again, he's very frail, very fragile. Um, that's why I did one arch at a time. And um, that's the area of 30. Do you remember what it looked like before? This is what it looked like before. And then here it is two weeks later. So the laser photo sterilizes the pocket removes whatever obligate anaerobes are deep, deep down in there that I know probably with my scalpel, I probably couldn't reach. It uh, removes the infected tissue, inflamed tissue only, and it recruits uh, immune cells to go in there and repair and regenerate this defect. Here, I was able to follow him for six months. Uh, he's back on his IV bisphosphonates at this point. Um, here he is at post-op, six months. You can see some starting to break down. And here's where we were pre-op, and there we are six months. And I think, I think I had him a year later. He wind up losing this tooth. It fell out. Um, and a lot of times these people just continue to get bone loss and osteonecrosis. But um, he wind up living like one more year. And again, his chief complaint was that he wanted to be able to eat. Um, and he was pretty happy. Even though he was missing these teeth, he didn't replace them. Um, this is another case where I just sort of ventured off label use. And I, um, this patient had this called hyperkeratosis. So we're taught in residency, anything red or white needs to be biopsied. Uh, and that's part of the, my, my examination, I do a head and neck exam and you're looking for cancer. And in my career, I've probably caught 10 cancers in the oral cavity. Uh, most of the patients have lived. Um, some have had jaw resection, tongue resection, um, you know, but most have lived. I think one passed away. Um, so here this patient has hyperkeratosis. I biopsied it to make sure it's just hyperkeratosis, not dysplasia, which it wasn't. So then I decided to treat it with a laser. And so here it is the day of the laser treatment. I went in and just removed all the hyperkeratotic tissue. And then here she comes back two weeks later. You see that I left a couple of tags. So I had to bring her back and actually it was him bring him back and remove these lesions. And then you follow these people. You see them like once a year because hyperkeratosis can turn into dysplasia very easily. So here's this pre and post-op. Um, this is another patient who had, um, had been to multiple surgeons, uh, two oral surgeons and another periodontist, and she had this really large, wide hyperkeratotic area, and they could never uh, figure out what was going on. So I did an incisional biopsy in several places, and it came back as hyperkeratosis. So I decided to remove this hyperkeratotic tissue with the laser while doing a uh, connective tissue graft. Remember the soft tissue graft on the to cover the roots. And so here's a better view. You see how, how diffuse her hyperkeratosis is. It didn't bother her, but for us as dentists, when we look in there and see this, this is really ominous. So you wanna make sure it's not a squamous cell carcinoma, which it can be. So I biopsied in several samples and she had had multiple biopsies with three other surgeons and they were all over hyperkeratosis. So I went ahead and treated her with a laser and that's the laser treatment. And then I did a connective tissue graft on these teeth. Uh, and I have not seen her for follow-up. 
So the other thing I can do with my laser is a phrenectomy. You see you have this frenum, which is an extension of the lip. It's like a tendon. And if you keep it, uh, if it stays really close to the teeth and cause recession, here it is. I did it with a laser. I did the NDAD. Now with my uh, erbium, I can do what, uh, actually I did it on an infant that was tongue-tied. Uh, you don't even have to numb them up. Uh, you just turn off the water and it, literally removes the attachment uh, in the floor of the mouth. I think, I, yeah, here it is. So you see this little guy right here? Um, it was, you know, he was crying. He was like six weeks old. He was having a hard time nursing. And I did a phrenectomy with my erbium laser. And that's what, right after it, the, sur the procedure. He wasn't numbed or anything, uh, just a little topical. Uh, I have a video, but I'm not sure that I'll be able to so um, the next reason that I got my uh, Fatona was to treat failing implants. So as more and more implants are being done, the failure rate of implants are going up. And there's multiple reasons why implants fail. It could be occlusion, malposition of the implant in the bone, cement around the crown of the implant. But as a periodontist, about a third of what I do is treat failing or ailing implants. So uh, I used to open the implant up, decontaminate the implant root or implant surface with uh, cavitron hand scalers and then tetracycline, and then I add bone. And another thing I do in my practice, I take blood from the patient and spin it down and make PRP, plasma-rich protein, that's another whole topic in itself. And what that does is it allows the patient's own growth factors to be expressed in the bone grafting. So that's what the PRP is. But I got the erbium or the Fatona laser with the erbium portion so that I could treat failing implants. Because the other procedure that I told you, all the steps, sometimes it's hit or miss. You could throw the kitchen sink at it and it still doesn't work. So um, I decided to try with the erbium laser. And so I have this guy um, who I had done this implant on in 2001, and the bone loss was noted 15 years later. You see the bone loss here. So I, op I offered him the option of using a laser to try to fix this or opening it up and grafting, and he decided to do the laser. And so the laser therapy, you use the erbium because remember, I said the NDAB is attracted by dark things. And this is pl uh, titanium, it's dark. If you use the NDAB on this, it will absorb the energy and literally fry the implant, literally fry it. And I've done it. So I've learned that if I'm going to use a laser on it, on the implant, I need to use the erbium laser, which is only picked up by water and hydroxyapatite. And that's what I did. Uh, I went ahead and treated him with the erbium laser, adjusted his occlusion because his bite was really hitting heavy, and that's probably why he got the bone loss. And then here you see I got most of the bone growth back. Is it perfect? No. But is this implant going to be fine? Yes. Um, so the maintenance therapy, again, after laser treatment, the patient can uh, brush or floss for like a week or 10 days or two weeks. Um, and we give them, uh, they can use this Paradex or Chlorhexidine. Then you can't instrument subgingively, like when they go back to their general dentist for a cleaning, they can't go below the gum line for six months because you want to wait for the bone the cementum, the ligament to re-adhere and attach. Okay, so I think that in my presentation, I kind of went through it, but um, here's my contact information. If you um, guys want to uh, send me an email or ask me questions. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs, for preparing this presentation. It was really intriguing to learn about um, periodontic and the laser therapy. Um, with that said, we have a few questions for you in the chat, if that's all right. Uh, should I bring the chat down or you'll bring it? I don't see uh, it. No, I'll just um, say the questions out loud for you. So um, the first question is, is there any limit to the amount of times that you can use the laser on, a, uh, on the same tissue site? And if so, are, are there any repercussions in doing so? What an excellent question. Who asked that? 
Oh, me? <laughs> uh, that's the question. Okay, so, yes. So, um, let me go back to this case. Um, it's really, really counterintuitive, and I had to learn from my mistakes. The more inflamed the site is, the less energy you use. It, you know, we are in America, the more, bigger, faster, you know, more. But the more inflamed the tissues, remember, with the NDAG, the energy is absorbed by dark things. So there's hemoglobin line cells all in the sulcus. So you, you use very little energy when someone has tremendous amount of inflammation. If the tissue is fibrotic, simple, for example, someone who smokes a lot, you can dial up your energy. You increase your wattage. But with this guy, um, so the pattern of how I use the laser, I go. So if this, pretend my pointer is the laser cannula, uh, I go from here to here. Then I go here to here. You can't, you can't stack them up side by side. If you do, you overheat this papilla and it will get uh, necrotic. It will resorb. So you want to use the laser as much energy as you need to interact with the tissue, but not enough to cause it to slough. Uh, can you repeat the laser surgery on someone? Yes. But um, a lot of times, if there's a failure or if there's a pocket that returns, there's usually other factors, such as an overhanging crown, the occlusion is off, um, there's an iatrogenic, which means like there's a filling that's misshaped, malformed, but you can reuse it. Again, um, I think your question was how many times can you do the laser surgery? I mean... In my career, I've been a periodontist now for 20 years. I can think of only two people that I've had to touch up one or two spots. But um, the biggest thing I learned with the laser is the more inflamed the site, the less energy you use, which is really very counterintuitive because you want to, the more inflamed you want to just go at it and give it as much energy as possible. But what it will do is will destroy the healthy tissue you're you're spreading the heat and you're going to just lose tissue. And I have done it. I think that answers your questions, right? I'm not sure. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually have a follow-up question. So how long of a duration of time will the laser therapy last? Or is it like just based on the gum health? That's an excellent question. It's based on many things. One, the provider who did the surgery. Two, the patient. Remember, everything you guys do in dentistry is in the patient's hand to make succeed or fail they don't brush they don't floss they don't go to the dentist it's gonna fail so if the pa most of my patients and i i was a general dentist first before i went back to specialize um most of my patients will listen pretty hard to what i have to say so they go on three to four month cleanings they go every three months to the dentist to get their teeth cleaned otherwise they um you'll see failure you'll see uh failure and I think that's one of the reasons, honestly, I went back to specialize is because I was super frustrated as a general dentist. I would be doing a filling on this kid who had like tons of cavities. They go out in the waiting room and the mom hands them a lollipop. And I'm like, you know, we just fixed five cavities on this kid. She's like, good job, Johnny. Here's a lollipop. And you're, whereas periodontal patients, they sort of select themselves out. And so when they come to you, they know you are their last hope. And so they, for the most part, follow what my recommendations are. For the most part, I'd say 70% do what we ask them to do. The other 30, you know, they're not going to. But it's way less in general dentistry. Like, it's way lower. <laughs> So that was another beautiful point about specializing. I mean, I love being a periodontist, but it just the patient pool sort of selects itself out and they know, like if you have heart disease and you go to the cardiologist, you're going to listen to what the cardiologist says, right? They say lose 50 pounds, stop smoking. You're going to stop smoking and you're going to lose 50 pounds. But your doctor could have been telling you for five years, lose 50 pounds, stop smoking. You're like, yeah, what does he know? He's just a doctor. But when you have a heart attack and you go to the cardiologist, they're like, oh, you know, I better, I better do what that guy said. And it's the same thing in perio. They pretty much know that they don't follow this. They're going to lose their teeth or their implant or whatever. 
So that was a good question. Thank you, Dr. Hodds. Another question we have is, what do you find challenging about periodontics? Oh, man. <laughs> So, I mean, I love, love, love being a periodontist. Um, probably the hardest thing is educating my referring doctors to refer sooner. You know, um, like this guy was self-referred, but I will have people that sit on their patients, their pockets go from four to six to eight to 10 to 12. And, you know, at 12 millimeter probing depth, you know, it's, it's a pretty hopeless situation. So it's, um, that is the biggest part. I'm, I'm in the point of my career, luckily, that I have a, you know, a, a very solid group of referrals who we've worked together so long that I don't, I don't worry about that. When I first started out, I wanted to work with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and 5% of the referrals made 95% of my headaches, which would be the patients would get there. They have no idea. For example, I saw somebody last week. Why are you here? I have no idea. Are you having any pain? Not at all. I have no clue why I'm here. And, and she's like, I have no problem. My dentist said I need to come see you. So there's a breakdown there, a communication between the general dentist and the hygienist and the patient. And of course, she doesn't perceive a problem, so she's not going to do anything about it, remember? So I try to explain, well, periodontal disease is silent, like a stroke. You know, it's like high blood pressure. You don't have any symptoms until it's too late and you have a stroke. And she's like, well, honey, I'm fine. I'm good. So she, you know, said, I'm going to think about it and let you know. And that's less and less because I have a select group of people that I work with. But um, when I first started out, that was the hardest, hardest part for me. And also, when I got out, I was in a male-dominated field, and that was pretty hard. Um, you know, most of the periodontists and oral surgeons are men. So it's a lot different now than it is, but, you know, I had people tell me that I was just taking up a space of a man in dental school uh, or whatever. But, you know, when I had my daughter, I missed two weeks of, of work because I'm self-employed, and if I don't work, you know, I don't get paid. So, but it's way better now than it was. It will, it really is. And I'm really lucky at this point in my career that I, I work with just a handful of people who appreciate me as a co-therapist and I appreciate them vice versa. And so our, the communication is very, very open. And, you know, they, like I said, people, like while I was on um, with you guys, I've gotten 10 texts from different dentists about questions. Uh, and I usually, you know, respond pretty reasonably. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. So the next question, um, you kind of touched about it a little bit, but um, why did you decide to go into dentistry and um, specialize in periodontics? So y'all have two hours? <laughs> no. Um, both my mom and dad were dentists. Um, so I grew up around dentistry. My mom was an endodontist. My dad was a periodontist. Um, but I went to dental school because, you know, I, I like to work with my hand. I liked helping people. I really, I wanted to go into medicine, but I knew I could not take it if something happened to one of my patients and they died. It would just literally, like something, when something goes wrong now, I feel like it's my fault, even though stuff happens. So I knew I could, I didn't have the, energy to be able to handle if a patient of mine died that's why i went into dentistry and i practiced general dentistry i remember graduating i graduated from university of maryland i remember grad standing at the stage graduation i'm thinking like wow you know now what um so i did a residency and i would recommend everyone do a general practice residency especially in these days i i feel like the dental schools are barely teaching people anything uh, I did a general practice residency in York Hospital. I would highly recommend that residency. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And then I did, I was chief resident at another hospital in Charlotte. And, and then I decided, you know what, um, I really like general dentistry, but it was not what I thought it would be. And so I met with an older dentist who was an endodontist and he's like, you know, Hannah, what do you want to do? Do you want to be down the road 10 years from now making more money and miserable? 
or do you want to do something different? I said, I want to do something different. So he said, specialize. So I started thinking endo. I was like, no, ortho, mm, you know, pedo, forget that. And it went around a bunch of, you know, screaming kids. And perio is surgery, but not as as long as oral surgery. Oral surgery, now you have to go to medical school. And so perio for me was three years. And I applied to University of California, San Francisco and got in. And I just got married. So we moved out west. And uh, I did my res- my residency and got my master's there. And then as soon as we finished, we moved back to North Carolina. So um, I tell you, I love being a periodontist. It is the most exciting field. There have been so many innovations in perio. Um, unbelievable. The bone growth factors, the lasers. There's so many dynamic changes in our field. Um, I just feel like it's the best field ever. Now, if what would I specialize again, the climate that it's in now? Probably not. Um, I'm really lucky because I have a bunch of dentists who are busy enough that they refer stuff out to endodontists, periodontists, oral surgeons. But most of the younger dentists getting out have a lot of debt and they just keep everything in house. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd go into a major city and practice. Um, not not that I'm in Midget, but like going in New York, it's tough. Miami, it's really tough. LA, California is tough. California is crazy. My classmates are struggling. And we've been out of school 20 years. So um, it's really hard as a specialist now. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hobbs. Um, another question is, I know like you've been out of school for so long, but how did you cope with and deal with failure during dental school, residency, and while practicing? Okay, so, so dental school is horrible. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. They treat you like crap. I hope it's better now. In residency, it was so different. They did not treat us like crap in perio residency or in uh, GPR. Uh, dental school, I mean, I just remember like thinking, I mean, I, I started just recently giving back to my dental school, University of Maryland. I just started donating, like now. I mean, we all, we still talk, all of us, you know, I don't know if you guys have, when you're in dental school, you sit alphabetically and you rotate the whole, all your classes, all your labs, everything. So my maiden name was Shahayab and I sat next to three, two Koreans and two uh, Chinese. And the, all of us are still friends till this day. We still communicate, and none of us can get over the trauma of dental school. It's so bad. Um, you just have to know that these people are, I don't know, I think it's better now. Honestly, I do think it's better. They, you just got to put in what you can get out, and that's what you have to look at it. And I, in, grad, in residency, perio residency, it was very different. It's very self motivated. Um, you know, they treat you like adults. You can do your lit review or you cannot. It's up to you, but it's going to reflect on your work. Um, Failures, failures are, you know, I think I was just talking to another mommy dentist. uh, I'm in this mommy dentist group, and we as women tend to take the failure personally, whereas the men are like, "Mm." I mean, I have a friend. He's a really good oral surgeon. He was doing a ramus block, which is when you take bone from the ramus, and you're going to augment it on the ridge to grow to help grow bone for an implant. And they use a mallet, chisel and mallet. Well, um, the patient who is like a really well-known um, anesthesiologist in the area came back like three days later. His face was really swollen. They take an x-ray. His, the mallet had slipped, and he broke his jaw. I would have been like, Oh my God, you know, would you like a new car? What can I, you know, can I buy your children's college education? He was like, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's in the consent. Uh, You know, it's part of what we do. So, you know, some of us that go into this have a more sensitivity and you take everything as a failure, as a, like you've done something wrong, but stuff happens in medicine all the time. Things fail. Stents don't work, they redo them, they recharge the patient, whereas in dentistry, they're like, oh my God, let me redo your crown for free. You don't like the shade, let me redo it or whatever. 
it's not like that in medicine. And if I could just meet myself back then, um, for example, in dental school, I would fret and frown if I didn't get a high A on one of my tests. If, you know, in the scheme of everything, it means nothing. It means literally nothing. Work on your Haitian skill set. Uh, and that's the biggest thing. Be in it for the long run. If I could give any advice to you, the people that are out there listening, treat your patients as if they're their mom, your sister, or your uncle. Don't just say that, but treat them that way. You know, people can tell. So if you try to like, it, try to find a way to connect with someone within the first 10 minutes that you meet them. The very first 10 minutes. Spend time to say, tell me about your dog. Let me see pictures of your grandchildren, whatever. Then they think, then they feel like you care about them, not just their wallet. And they will trust you and they will listen to what you have to say. As far as failure in dental school, you know, again, if I could meet myself and say, don't worry about getting a B on the neuroanatomy exam from, from Dr. Chen. It means nothing in my career. It meant zero. But I probably lost like, Two weeks worth of crying about getting a B versus an A it means nothing. Everyone fails and just learn from your failures. That's the whole key. Dentistry fails, people fail. You know, everyone fails. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. Um, this kind of segues into our next question, but um, when a treatment doesn't go according to plan, how do you proceed in terms of interacting with the patient? That's a great question. Did you ask that, Tiffany? I mean, I wrote it, I wrote it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the best thing with patients, you know, they want honesty. So let's say, um, you know, you, you were taking out a tooth and you couldn't get all the root out. You have to just sit down and patient say, I really tried hard, but I can't get this tooth out. If I try any harder, I'll force it into the sinus or whatever. So just honesty and, you know, People want to be heard. So if they feel like you care about them, and for me, for me, I'll speak for me, I, I um, like honor my work. I warranty my work. So if something fails, most of the time I work with the patient, either do it at no charge over again. So I saw a patient of mine I did an implant on um, last year. And the general dentist left a bead of wax. You guys know what that is? bead wax no so it, when they um get the crown and the abutment for the implant there's like a seating jig it's like a jig that you seat around the implant to help orient how the abutment and the crown goes on the tooth well it's in wax they shoved that into the gum and it caused this incredible amount of bone loss on my implant and i know um he has an implant that I did on the other side. So I saw him and I was like, oh my God, I, we took an x-ray. It was incredible amount of bone loss. So what I wound up doing is I took, I got the implant out, which wasn't easy because it had bone loss just on one side, but it was affecting the tooth in front of it. So I took that out at no charge, even though I had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with that failure, but it was mainly for that guy had been my patient for a long time. And, you know, someone messed up. It wasn't me, and I wasn't going to throw the other dentist under the bus, but it was just to honor him and to treat him as if I would want to be treated. And, you know, he appreciated that. He's like, no, no, let me pay you. You worked really hard, and I was going to re redo his implant. I'm going to charge him half my implant fee when I redo it because I literally have to buy, you know, an implant, all the burrs, blah, blah, blah. But I think being honest and trying to not look at a patient as a bank account, I, I see that so much now with younger dentists that they try to get as much as they can from the patient. And you will get that one time, but the next time that patient needs something, they'll not come back. They will feel like they were nickel and dimed and charged too much or whatever, or that they're an endless source of money. So with, with that patient, Mr. Mr. Dan, I'll call him, I just told him, you know, I didn't say anything about that. I said, there's a contamination on the implant. I'm really sorry. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to graft it. It'll be no charge for you. And I'll redo your implant at half the price. He was like super happy. 
you know, I could I have charged him for everything? Yeah. It didn't was it hard to get that implant out? Heck yeah. I mean it took me an hour. It was very, very physically um demanding, but it's the right thing to do. And if you do the right thing in the long run, the money will follow. The money will follow if you do the right thing in the long run because your reputation is what, especially if you're in a small town or whatever, will will precede you. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. So this kind of segues into the next question, but if you don't mind sharing, um, how did you pay off your student loans from like dental school and residency? Okay, so residency, that's not fair because I was married. So my husband, <laughs> he put it to me. Um, oh, man. So in dental school, I was uber poor, like really poor. I worked, you know, my parents didn't help me in dental school. I had, a col- I had a scholarship in college. In dental school, I had four jobs, no lie. I was the transcriber for the notes. I don't know if they still do that. I worked in the microbiology lab pouring up agar, you know, for the, so I, that was my job on Sunday. I would go bro- boil the broth. Then I worked catering Sunday morning uh, at Fells Point in Baltimore. And from that, I got food to bring home because I remember I was like uber poor. And then I cleaned houses uh, other days <laughs> that I didn't. So I just worked in dental school and when I went to dental school, I do you want to know what my interest loan was? One of my heel loans was? Do you want to know what the interest rate was? Sure. Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent. It was unreal. So I worked in dental school just to pay the interest on that loan so it didn't compound when I graduated. Um, and I just you know, when I, I lived really, really meagerly when I got out of dental school and my husband and I, when we went to grad school, even though we were in San Francisco, when we moved back to North Carolina, we lived in a $200,000 house. two purposes but work live below your means for a long time that's it thank you so much dr hobbs um you cut out a little bit but we did get the general idea of just living to your needs not your wants yeah, li- live below. I mean, and, and that's really hard. It's very, very difficult. You know, um, trust me, I would go to these meetings and like, I just got a Maserati and I'm like, I'm driving a 10 year old Sequoia, you know, but it doesn't matter because my accountant, I once, once told me, um, and I have an accounting firm that manages a lot of doctors and dentists. And he said he had a physician. I think he was a cardiothoracic surgeon. He earned $300,000 a month, a month, and he could not make ends meet on $300,000 a month. He had to take money from the month ahead, like take a draw. And I was like, how could he not live on $300,000 a month? Well, he had a yacht, two ex-wives, five cars, blah, 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 but you know, and I remember thinking like, my God, that's, you know, that's a lot of money a month to, to take home. That was his take home. Hey, that wasn't his, that wasn't his, you know, before taxes, that was his take home. Hey, um, but he had to borrow on every month on the next month's pay because he had, you know, X, Y, and Z debt. And I remember learning that from him, like thinking that's, you know, that guy's miserable. He's got to do so much. And that was another thing. Um, so I went to grad school. One of my uh, mentors who 
taught me so much. Um, he was Steve Jobs' periodontist, the guy from Apple. And Dr. Lauber said to me, you know, Hannah, bigger isn't always better. And I said, what do you mean, Dr. Lauber? And he said, well, he started out as me as a periodontist, single he had hygienist and, you know, four or five staff. Then he got really big. He had like 29 employees. His payroll every month was around just his payroll, you know, over 300,000. So he had to produce $300,000 worth of dentistry in order just to pay his payroll, not even his, you know, expenses, rent, you know, supplies, whatever. So he said, I was way more profitable when I was smaller than when I got bigger. My headaches got bigger. He had to have a management company. There was just all kinds of turmoil. So he said, if you, he used to always call me kid. He said, kid, if you can remember anything is that bigger isn't better. So if that, that's another piece of advice that I always remember from him that to keep it small. And I have a, I don't take any insurance. I'm totally fee for service. So I do one thing at a time and I charge for my time and my patients, they, I don't take their insurance. They have to file it. You know, we file it for them to reimburse them, but I'm booked, you know, three, four weeks in advance because people want to have somebody spend time with them and communicate and feel like they're cared for, not a mill run in, run out, run in and and that's unfortunately where a lot of medicine and dentistry is going to. Um. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hobbs. Um, so then I know you talked about a lot about residency. So do you have any advice about how to make yourself more competitive for that during dental school? Oh, for dental school? So, um, I'll be honest, you know, when I finished dental school, I had no idea that I wanted to be a periodontist. Um, I think, I know I'm mentoring a lot of people here around me locally. They're trying to get into dental school. Dental school is super competitive now. I don't know why, but <laughs> it's really competitive now. Like I have this young girl that I'm mentoring. She's like you guys' age and she has like a four, some 4.0 in college and has worked in in a dental field, you know, everything she can't get in anywhere. I don't I don't understand it. She, this is her third year applying and I really don't understand. But anyway, if you want to specialize, my suggestion would be to find not necessarily somebody at the dental school because the people that teach at the dental school are either ex military or or they're not have not been in private practice, for lack of a better word, the full-time faculty. So I would try to shadow, uh, and that's what a lot of people do. They come shadow in my office to just see what it's like to be a parent, shadow a periodontist, work with them in the summers, try to work part-time with them in the field that you want to specialize. So let's say you want to be an orthodontist. Go work in an orthodontist office on your vacation. Go shadow that person any time off you have. See how they run their business. See how they run the practice. See how the flow of the practice is. And obviously, you get good grades, but, you know, everyone gets good grades. But if you have um, a strong letter of recommendation, so let's say, Tiffany, you come shadow me and you want to go to perio school. I'll write you like a phenomenal as like Tiffany, Tiffany Liu. She's amazing. I would, uh, I know the Dean of the university of Maryland. He was a few years ahead of me in dental school. I would write him a letter. I'm like, dear Dr. Reynolds, I cannot spit, say enough great things about Tiffany. She's um, amazing. She would be an asset to dentistry. She has a, a compassionate heart, her skill level. She's uh, incredibly bright, blah, blah, blah. So I think that's one thing I would do besides getting good grades. And um, try to learn from every faculty you have, especially the part-time volunteer faculty in, in the dental school. Those are the people that you just want to, they have been out there in the fields, they know. Unfortunately, a lot of the full-time faculty at dental schools are either, have never been in practice or they're ex-military retired. And so I know everyone's busy in dental school, but 
my roommate and I in dental school, we would go shadow this dentist that was around the corner just to see what it was like to, you know, run a business, how to, and we would like run the sterilization for him. That was one of my other jobs. Um, you know, we'd run, <laughs> run the sterilization. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hobbs. That That is the end of our session today. Thank you everyone for joining our session this evening. Uh, we'll go ahead and post the quiz in the group me chat. You have 24 hours to take the quiz and we'll see you hopefully in our next session on Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you. You have another session on Sunday? Yes. Well, thank you so much awesome. again, Dr. Hobbs. Um, we really time. appreciate your time and everything you've shared with us. Uh, it's good to see you all. And Cherry, salam alaikum. <laughs> salam alaikum. <laughs> Bye. All right. I just ended the.